A Patriot's History of the United States. From Chapter 20, Reaganophobia. Liberal textbook writers have endeavored to distort Reagan's record more than they have any other subject except the Great Depression. They began by attempting to minimize the extent of Reagan's massive and shocking victory by pointing to low turnout, which had in fact been exacerbated by massive drives by liberals to register voters who in fact had no intention of ever voting. Another strategy to discredit Reagan was to attack his acting career, pointing to the absence of many critically acclaimed roles. This allowed them to label him a B actor. Yet this argument contradicted another line of attack on the Gipper, claiming that he had no genuine political instincts or serious policy ideas and that he was merely a master of the camera. Both the Democrats and the media continually underestimated Reagan, mistakenly thinking that his acting background and camera presence had supplied his margin of victory. Neither group took seriously his ideas or the fact that those ideas were consistent and appealed to a large majority of Americans. Refusing to engage in combative dialogue with his media enemies, Reagan repeatedly used them to his advantage and kept his eyes on the prize. Reagan was, in fact, widely read and perceptive, too. In 1981, he latched on to a path-breaking book by George Gilder, Wealth and Poverty, which, to the lament of mainstream academics, turned the economic world upside down with its supply-side doctrine and stunning insights. Reagan's diary, published in 2007 and a collection of his handwritten radio addresses, released six years earlier, testified to a sharp mind that addressed a broad range of issues and to a man in charge of his advisors and staff, giving them policies, not vice versa. Symbolically, although Carter had negotiated an end to the hostage crisis, the Ayatollah did not release the prisoners until January 20. 1981, the day of Reagan's inauguration. It was a characteristic of Reagan in his diary to note how sorry he had felt for the departing Carter, who had not had the fortune of seeing the hostages released. Symbolism aside, the Reagan revolution shocked the FDR coalition to its roots. Even unions started to splinter over supporting some of Reagan's proposals. And although publicly the Democrats downplayed the extent of the damage, privately Democratic Party strategist Al Fromm was so shaken that he initiated a study to determine if Reagan was a fluke or if a broad transformation of the electorate had started to occur. He did not like the answers. Going in, Reagan knew that fixing more than a decade's worth of mismanagement in energy, monetary policy, national security, and other areas of neglect would be a long-term prospect. It required a policy style that did not veer from crisis to crisis, but which held firm to conservative principles, even when it meant disregarding short-term pain. Equally important, it meant that Reagan personally had to ditch the Carter malaise that hung over the nation like a blanket and replace it with the old-fashioned can-do optimism that was inherently Reagan-esque. The Gipper accomplished this by refusing to engage in beltway battles with reporters or even Democrats on a personal basis. He completely ignored the press, especially when it was critical. Laughing and joking with Democrats, he kept their ideology, which he strenuously opposed, separate from the people themselves. These characteristics made it intensely difficult even for Washington reporters and diehard Democrats to dislike him, although Carter resented the election loss for more than a decade. Reagan frustrated reporters and intellectuals with a maddening simplicity, asking why we needed the Federal Reserve at all and why, if the ozone layer was being destroyed, we couldn't replace it. He possessed a sense of humor and self-deprecation not seen since Truman. 
Having acted in his share of bad movies, Reagan provided plenty of ammunition to critics. When one reporter brought him a studio picture from a movie he had made with a chimpanzee, Bedtime for Bonzo, the Gipper good-naturedly signed it and wrote, I'm the one with the watch. (laughs) Just two months after his inauguration, Reagan was the victim of an assassination attempt by John Hinckley that only made him more sympathetic in the eyes of the Republic. With a bullet still lodged in his chest, Reagan, taken into surgery, quipped to the doctors, I hope you're all Republicans. <laughs> in his 1982 State of the Union address, the Gipper quoted George Washington. Then, lampooning his own age, he added, For our friends in the press, who place a high premium on accuracy, let me say I did not actually hear George Washington say that, but it is a matter of historic record. Aware the nation needed to revive the spirit of achievement, Reagan introduced everyday American heroes in his State of the Union message. When celebrating triumphs, whether over inflation, interest rates, unemployment, or communism, Reagan used we or together. When calling on fellow citizens for support, he expressed his points in clear examples and heartwarming stories. An example, he said, was always better than a sermon. No matter what he or government did, to Reagan it was always the people of the nation who made the country grow and prosper. More important, he did not hesitate to speak what he thought was the truth, calling the Soviet Union the evil empire, a term that immediately struck a note with millions of Star Wars fans conjuring up the image of a decrepit Soviet leader as the emperor bent on destroying the galactic republic, America. Once preparing to make a statement about the Soviet Union, Reagan did not realize a microphone was left on, and he joked to a friend, the bombing begins in five minutes. Horrified reporters scurried about in panic, certain that this gunslinger cowboy president was serious. But Reagan relied on more than language to accomplish his goals. Criticized as a hands-off president, he in fact was a master delegator using a troika of Edwin Meese, James Baker, and Donald Reagan, who held various advisory positions with Baker and Reagan actually trading jobs in 1985 to supervise every important issue and early on relying on the advice of his top aide, Judge William Clark. That left Reagan free to do the strategic thinking and to galvanize public opinion. Indeed, Reagan flustered his opponents, who thought him intellectually weak, precisely because he did not micromanage and thus devoted himself to the truly important issues, often catching his adversaries completely unaware. His grasp of the details of government, clear in his autobiography, An American Life, shows that in one-on-one meetings over details of tax cuts, defense, and other issues, Reagan had mastered the important specifics. However, he also believed in getting the best people and letting them speak their mind, even when he had made up his. He repeatedly left hotly charged meetings telling the participants, I'll let you know my decision, rather than embarrass the losing side in front of the winners. And we'll go on with Tax Cuts Revive the Nation in the next video. Please like, subscribe, and leave a comment below. I'd love to hear from you guys. Thanks so much for watching. I love you. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.